In this presentation, I am going to build on what Bonnie Hamilton described in Chapter 15 relating to online privacy, safety, and copyright, and try to help you see connections to your own educational context. Along the way, I will show you a few of my go-to resources on these topics. Let's first look at the issue of privacy, and I'd like to direct you to one of my go-to sites for this topic. Common Sense Media is a fantastic resource for educators, parents, and children on safe and responsible use of digital media. For younger students, Common Sense has a free app and web-based game called Digital Passport. Targeted at elementary age students, Digital Passport explains to students how to maintain their privacy online, use websites and apps safely, and use and transform online materials. The supportive documentation for parents and educators provides some valuable tips in regards to privacy and ways to discuss online privacy with younger learners. They break down online privacy into three categories, and I think these areas are important for students of all ages, and really all of us who are online, to be knowledgeable about. The first area is privacy and security. This involves keeping personal, identifiable information private to reduce identity theft. Identifiable numbers like social security numbers fall into this area. And for children, Bonnie Hamilton and others recommend being mindful of using student names in online spaces. Hamilton advises first names only if names of children are used in an online space. Avatars and screen names can be used to protect identity privacy, and I am currently doing this in one of my graduate courses for an online leaderboard. This is a screenshot of the leaderboard for the course. While privacy is certainly an important issue for educators of children, particularly under the age of 13, as Hamilton explained in Chapter 15, I want you to take away from our study of this area that we need to be mindful of privacy concern for our learners of all age levels. And though I am teaching adults in a graduate program, I am incorporating the recommendations of common sense media and other digital citizenship advocates in order to protect the privacy of my students when we venture into online spaces. This leads to the second area, which is privacy and reputation. This area involves being concerned about limiting the spread of embarrassing, hurtful, and harmful information about individuals in online spaces. Electronic aggression is a term used for harassment and bullying, or cyberbullying, that is done using electronic technology, and it has become quite a problem for children and adults. Electronic aggression is difficult to deal with because it can carry on 24-7 throughout the day and night, and harmful messages can spread like wildfire very, very quickly to many people and geographic locations. It is very hard for the person being harassed or cyberbullied to get away from. Like anything that is posted online, once hurtful messages, pictures, etc. are sent or posted online, they are very difficult to completely remove. Think about your digital footprint online, that is, the trail that you have left through your online activities. Here are some pieces of your footprint. Social media comments and postings, messages, voice calls and emails, and site visits and usage records. While this may be somewhat unsettling, consider that digital footprints can be used for harm or for good. Being mindful about the kind and amount of information that we are sharing online is healthy, and it can reduce our risk of being a victim of identity theft or other malicious actions. I think it is important for educators to have a professional presence online. This means using social media, online writings, blog postings, and so on to share and promote education and your leadership and contributions to this field. In a later section of this course, we will look at how we can curate our digital presence online so that these footprints can work for good on our behalf. This leads to the third area, privacy and advertising. So digital footprints consist of explicit acts and implicit trails. Explicit acts are the intentional use of online services, apps, and sites in which we recognize that we are leaving an imprint through our use of these services and thus we acknowledge that the service can have some control relating to this imprint. The implicit trails, though, relate to tracking where you go and what you do online in order to customize your user experience and market to you. 
These implicit trails can be linked across contexts to create a profile of what you do, think, associate with, and so on. Educators and parents of children can develop the awareness in children that ads they see online are being targeted to them and help them to see the connection between what they view online and what products they see popping up in advertisements. Safety and privacy go hand in hand. As I've mentioned earlier in this presentation, safe use of the internet includes not revealing too much personal information and dealing with cyber bullies. In addition to this, internet safety also involves things like limiting exposure to inappropriate materials, protecting from online predators, and being smart about spyware spam and scams. NetSmarts is a program from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They provide a freely available curriculum and resource materials for educators and parents to use to teach about internet safety, as well as online games and activities about internet safety for kids and teens. These are some of the games for teens that embed internet safety concepts through the, through the games, such as avoiding viruses, writing strong passwords, and limiting the sharing of personal information online. Here's an excerpt from the Primary Grade Safety Pledge. The language used is simple for young students to understand and it addresses four key areas. Informing trusting adults of things that make them uncomfortable online not posting personal information online, not meeting anyone in person that they have met online, and being respectful and kind in online spaces. The NetSmart's curricular materials for intermediate, middle, and high school students address these same areas, but they communicate them in ways that target these older students. The NetSmart curricular materials have internet safety rules for middle and high school students as well and you can see how they build on the foundation established in the lower grades and they empower students to begin to make responsible decisions about protecting themselves online being respectful and mindful about what they post online and being careful about meeting online friends in person i also encourage you to check out some of the net smarts tip sheets Here's an excerpt from Social Media Safety for Teens. These tips apply those four basic safety rules to the use of social media apps and sites. For instance, check your comments and images advises students to not post anything inappropriate or illegal, including threats, nudity, alcohol, and drugs. And it encourages students to check their privacy settings on these sites and apps so that they are limiting how much information they are sharing with friends versus the public. And as with recommendations regarding privacy that I shared earlier, these steps are good for us as adults to follow to make sure that we are practicing safe online behavior in the online tools, websites, and apps that we are using. Finally, in this presentation, I'd like to highlight what you, as someone in educational technology, should know about copyright. As Hamilton relates towards the end of Chapter 15, this topic can be quite hazy. But it is important for you to know that as an educator, you do have something called fair use that you can claim in order to justify your use of copyrighted materials in certain circumstances. There are four factors of fair use. Number one, the purpose and character of use. This is the important one to remember. So fair use guidelines are intended to make it allowable for copyrighted materials to be used in circumstances of education, parody, and commentary. What is at the heart of this is that the use will be transformative, meaning that new expression, meaning, and value is being added to the original work. According to copyright attorney Rich Stim, 2010, the value added to a copyrighted work could be through creating new information, new aesthetics, new insights, and understandings. How transformative your use needs to be is not clearly defined, but if you were taken to court, this is one of the key areas that a judge would consider in regards to your use. The second factor is the nature of the copyrighted work. While again this is not clearly defined, you would tend to have a stronger case if you use factual works versus fictional works, and if you used published works versus not yet published works. 
STEM explains that the use of factual works tends to be given more leeway in fair use rulings because the dissemination of facts or information benefits the public. He also says that authors have the right to control the first public appearance of his or her expression, and that's why cases involving published works are more likely to fall under fair use allowances than those involving unpublished works. Number three, the amount of use. If you search for fair use guidelines for educators online, you will see recommendations for the number of pages of a book, images from a photographer series, seconds of a song, and so on, that you are advised to stay within. While such guidelines are certainly helpful, the point is that the amount of the work that you use should be a relatively small portion in compared to the larger work. This gives you room for that transformation aspect in which you add value by combining it with other works and ideas. The fourth factor of fair use is the effect of use on the potential market of the copyrighted work. What this means is that your use of the copyrighted work should not deprive the owner of that work from making money off of the work. Consider whether you should be purchasing the work or if you should ask permission from the copyright owner to use the work. Taking such a step could help the copyright owner to see your use as not impacting his or her potential income from that work. For the purpose of this course, you will likely encounter copyright and fair use issues in regards to wanting to use images, audio, and possibly video clips in your projects. While the purpose of your use is likely to meet the first fair use factor of being an educational purpose of use, you should still consider the other factors in deciding if you are abiding by the fair use allowances for copyrighted works, how transformative your project is to the original work, the nature and amount of the copyrighted work you are using, and the potential market impact of your use of the copyrighted work. So what I recommend doing is deciding whether or not you really need that copyrighted work. For instance, can you find a comparable image from a public domain, creative commons, or otherwise free-to-use source? There are many great sources of stock image and music sites, as photographers, illustrators, and musicians recognize the need for and the value of freely sharing their works with others for reuse in many types of projects. I encourage you to check these sources first. Some of my favorites are Pixabay and Free Music Archive. A nice feature of these sites is that you can filter your searches by media type, orientation, genre, etc. And this can be very helpful as you are designing instructional materials to be able to find just the right image, music file, and so on that will work for your project. You can also create your own original image or other kinds of media rather than use someone else's that could be copyrighted. It may actually be a time saver to capture the exact image or video clip that you need, rather than try to find and adapt something from another source. These are some original photos that I, my son, and his third grade classmates have taken recently for some of the educational materials and presentations we have been creating lately. I think we reap an added benefit when we take the pictures ourselves because it forces us to think more deeply about the concepts and ideas and is in a way like teaching others through the media that we create. So there you have it, some very important ideas and resources to know about regarding privacy, safety, and copyright. Remember that privacy involves both the explicit acts that you do when you intentionally use online services and applications and implicit trails of what you do online. Safe internet use means not only keeping personal information private, but also using online tools in ways that are respectful, responsible, and legal. Common Sense Media and NetSmart have many resources including games for kids and teens on these topics. Copyrighted materials may be easy to download and use, but users should be prepared to justify their use of any copyrighted materials with the four fair use factors should the copyright owner file a claim against them. Creative Commons and other copyright-free materials are often a better alternative, and there are many great resources for obtaining a variety of media to use in instruction and educational projects.